So here we have Ezekiel's vision from the Lord. Now, I want to give a preface of what the discussion was going up from verses 1 through 20. Just a brief summary is, chapter 18 is about accountability. Chapter 18 is about who is held accountable for what. Just to summarize, verse 20 is, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So, we cannot blame someone else, nor can we take credit for someone else, nor can we shift blame to someone else. I cannot say that my father should suffer my, for my sins, nor can he say that I should suffer for his. I will suffer for my sins and he will suffer for his. That is through our punishment. Now, with righteousness, I cannot just find someone righteous and say to that man, let's say my father, my father lives well. Father, can you grant me some of your righteousness? We are all humans on this earth. We cannot do that. We don't have the authority to do that, nor would that be just. But then he continues in verse 21. After discussing about all the accountability, he then says something very puzzling. Now the Israelites, though they may not have liked to hear it, they would have probably agreed with everything up until there. Well, I do righteousness, I get rewarded. I do wickedness, I get punished. That makes sense to them. That all makes sense. Then he says, But if the wicked will turn from all his sins... No, he's not calling this the righteous. He's calling this person the wicked. If the wicked turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live and shall not die. So how come this person who is called wicked is now being blessed with life? And he says, All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? Now this brings me back to a New Testament proverb, New Testament parable about the prodigal son about how joyous it was when the prodigal son returned. Because it, it showed something. It didn't matter what the prodigal son had done. The prodigal son should not have done that. But what mattered to the father was that the prodigal son had turned. And that's what God is saying here. Now this would have made no sense to the Israelites at the time. They had a belief at the time called the Retribution Principle. Now, the retribution principle is pretty closely related to the Hindu term karma. That is, if you do wrong, wrong will be done unto you. If I lie to someone, then I'm going to get sunburned the next day, or a squirrel is going to come down and attack me. I will get what's coming to me, was the belief. And the belief was is that every single action is counted up and then God brings justice upon it either in this world or in the next based entirely upon a weighting of your actions versus the other actions. But here we have in Ezekiel the Lord saying, But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live and shall not die. That's incredible. That's a wonderful blessing that you don't see elsewhere. But then he says the inverse, which is, But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, righteousness, and cometh iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. 
In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. So think about that. We are, let's say, the righteous people. And if we are the righteous people and we move forward, it doesn't matter what we did in our past. We could have been the greatest people of all time. We could have been so holy and so caring But if we turn from that righteousness and go into sin, all of that that we did, it doesn't mean anything. It's nice that we did it. But God doesn't see that we did all that. God sees what we turn to. And for this reason, Israel replies to the Lord, He says, Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal, is not your way unequal. See, they are critiquing God's equality. They're saying, if this person does wickedness all their life, and this person does righteousness all their life, so what if they turn at the end? Equality should have the person who does more righteous have a better life and more blessings than the person who does more wickedness. In their mind... It doesn't matter what you truly are or your faithfulness to God. To them, it matters as though you're weighting off a scale. I see see the weights of justice outside the courthouses, the person with the blindfold. It's just a weighting. And I saw someone that gave a great comparison it was wrong, but it helped me understand very well how the world views heaven and hell. As they said, hell is on one side and heaven is on the other side. And which one tips more, that's where you go. Whether you tip more for righteousness or tip more for wickedness. But that's not what the Bible says. He says, When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Now why is this? Now it's using the terms of doing wickedness and doing righteousness and turning from righteousness and doing wickedness. But there is a reason behind why you do what you do. You see, the Bible simplifies it in a way that we can see it, in a way that we can perceive it, and in a way that we can measure it. You see, as anyone who is a sinner and they turn to Christ, and they truly turn to Christ, they seek after Christ. Their life changes. Their thoughts change. Everything changes about them. They don't become perfect, but they turn from their ways. They still got weaknesses, but they do turn, and they do try to turn. You see, what he's describing here is what you would observe, what you would see. What he's describing here is repentance. See, when we are saved, and this is part of the Christian life, is we repent of our sins. We don't want to do our sins. Scripture actually says that like, I believe the exact wording is, is like a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool returns to his iniquity. Well, it's true. We return to our wickedness time and time again. But when we're changed, we understand that that's wickedness. And we understand that we shouldn't do that, and we try not to do that. You see, Ezekiel lived in a time of practicality. And he was describing to them very intricately, this is what you will see happening when someone truly turns to God. Now, they would not have known the name Jesus. They wouldn't have known the name Christ. But they would have known Yahweh. They would have known who to turn to, who the true God was. And they would have known His laws and His statutes. And they would have made a choice pretty much every single day. Follow them or don't. 
So when they choose from not following to following, that's a repentance. That's a devotion to God. But inversely, when you live your life following it, well, that's your habit. To go against your habits is intentional. And so when you live your life in righteousness and you then turn against that righteousness, you're making a choice of yourself over that righteousness. That you don't care what God says. Maybe you don't believe in God. Maybe you don't think God has the right. Maybe you, like Israel, think God is unequal and that you don't need to listen to Him. For whatever reason, you have decided consciously to turn away from God. He says, Yet saith the house of Israel, The way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal, are not your ways unequal. God is again angry because Israel doesn't understand this. He's saying time and time again, this is a choice between intentionally rejecting God and intentionally following God. And in the end, the person who stays righteous is not seen any different as the person who turned from wickedness to righteousness. Because their sins, they shall not be mentioned unto him. To God, you either lived in sin or you lived in righteousness. And when we receive Christ, when we repent and when we turn to God, our sins, it's as though they never happened. Now we have to live with our consequences, but God will not hold them against us. And that's what Israel doesn't understand. See, Israel worked in the same way that we work nowadays. Debt and penance. Debt and payment. That everything was on a balance, on a scale, that you could switch back and forth, and that if you had too much over here, you could outweigh it over here. That sin was a debt that we could pay back. That if I stole from someone, I could pay it back by giving. As a matter of fact, there was a commentary from the 13th century about Robin Hood, where it said Robin Hood earned his room in heaven, paying for his sins of theft by his greater gift to the poor. People even nowadays still believe this, that you can earn your way to heaven. And that's, that's really what God is addressing here. Though it uses iniquity and righteousness, what it is that He's addressing here is the causes of these. And think about it. When you turn from iniquity to righteousness, that's not easy. It's not. If you can get away with stealing... Why would you quit? It's easy money. You could live really well. Why would you give that up? If you could get away with lying, why would you give that up? If you could get away with murder, you could get rid of a lot of people you don't like. There's so many, and I want to word this carefully, conveniences with sin. Now, sinning is not actually good. But it's really appealing to many people. So when you choose not to do that, you're choosing it for a reason. You're choosing something above that convenience. You're seeing this value for yourself and saying, that doesn't matter to me. But he says, therefore, this is to Israel, which has now accused God of being unequal. God of being unequal for saying that He would show greater favor to the repentant than to the, I'll use a modern term, the backslidden righteous. Now another term that I believe is actually more apt in this situation is a term called carnal Christianity. Someone who... There's actually a couple definitions, but a really simplified way of describing it is 
not truly following Christ. I've heard a couple ways of it being said as someone who follows Christ for the benefits. Doesn't actually follow him, but uses him more as a reservation for heaven. Or someone who follows him in name only. Yeah, my family's Christian. Yeah, I I grew up in church. But what it is, is someone who isn't truly one devoting their life for God. And secondly, they're not putting their identity in God. Especially back at this time, if you were righteous, you were the righteous one. The high and mighty. You were seen as greater than all others, and they would take that to their advantage. Now, I'm not saying every person who was righteous was doing it for the view of others. But the righteous man who turns back to his sin was never devoted to that righteousness in the first place. If you lived your life righteously for God, truly for God, though you might slip up, I don't think you would fall into all of the sin. You'll slip up probably every single day. But it doesn't just say a slip up. It doesn't say a mistake. It say, when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth. That is, this person is undiscernible from the wicked man. Does not matter how greatly they lived, if you saw them on the street, you wouldn't know who they followed. And if you had to place a bet on it, you probably wouldn't say God. This person lived their life no differently than the wicked, as though they had never been transformed by God. As though they had never sought God. So Israel does not care for the idea that this person who lived righteously their entire life, except at the end, that they would be treated worse than the person who lived wickedly their entire life, except when they turned away. But he says to them who question him, he says, Are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so your iniquity shall not be your ruin. Your iniquity shall not be your ruin. He gave warning after warning. And Israel here is saying is the wicked one. He's not saying Israel is the great righteous. He's saying, Israel, you are in sin. This is from Ezekiel. Ezekiel was writing during what was known as the Babylonian captivity. Israel was taken into captivity for a reason. But when he says you're ruined, he's not talking about the ruin of the nation. The nation had already fallen. These people were already slaves. What did they have left to lose? Their eternal souls. So he says, Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby you have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. He asks a question. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? He was pleading with Israel. You don't have to die. He tells them, you don't have to die. You don't have to reach ruin. Because he takes no pleasure in this. I've, I've heard people say, I saw 
There's a group called Westboro Baptist Church. And they would go out and they would go into parades and they would hold up signs. One of the signs I saw that really sickened me was, When the wicked die, God laughs. God doesn't laugh. See, God takes no joy in their death. God doesn't want a single one of them to die. But why will they die? Because they won't listen. You see, Israel was the righteous. Israel was the righteous nation when every other nation was following Dagon or following Molech. Israel was following Yahweh. But then Israel became the wicked one. Israel became the nation that was following after these other gods. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because he would warn them time and time again and they would not listen. But Scripture's not just for Israel. Scripture was delivered to Israel. Was there a single verse in this entire Bible that we can't use in our lives? Is there even a single verse in this Bible that we cannot learn from? You see, Israel was God's chosen people. If even they could fall, what do we think of our nations? America was started in 1776. What of England before America? Well, now you go to England, you can't even pray in public. What about Rome from before then? They turned to God towards almost the end, but then they fell right back into their hedonistic lifestyles, putting their own desires over God, and they fell. There are so many nations that have such great potential, but when we turn from God, we bring upon ourselves our own ruin. We bring upon first our ruin on this earth. And that's the least of our concerns. See, even if, even if through our wickedness, we could bring upon ourselves the entire world under our control. We had all the money in the world. We had everything we had ever desired. But we still lost our souls. What do we have in the end? See, what profiteth a man if he gain the whole world but to lose his own soul? This is why the Lord gave Ezekiel this warning. This entire chapter is about accountability. Because everyone there wanted to blame someone else. They wanted to say, this is unfair, this is unfair. They even called God Himself unfair. Because God didn't value man by man's ways. See, if you were to give me that, if you were to give our, our great judges that, I'd say, you're a murderer, you donate to a charity, uh, you go to prison forever, you get paradise forever. But that's not how God sees things. You see, that person who followed, who did the right thing, is their heart there. Is that all that they ever did? Is it they killed two people but donated to three charities? You see, when we try to make it a balancing game, what even is what even is good? What even is evil if we get to decide? Did God ever say in Leviticus, this sin is worse than this one, and this one's worth five of this? It's not a balanced system. It's a heart issue. If we have a heart for ourselves, we will die by ourselves. We will not be received by God because we push God away our entire life. And even if we supposedly follow God our entire life, we prayed our five prayers every day, we had the beads. Even if we did everything right and we felt that there was a system, a coded system, 
But in the end of the day, every day we think, I think I did righteous enough today. I think God's good. I think I did well enough today. I think God will let me in. If I did good enough, God has to let me in. He owes it to me. That won't get anyone into heaven. If we think that God owes it to us because of what we did on this earth, we will get nowhere. Because in the end, we are not saying that God gave us heaven. We're saying that we took it. And likewise, sometimes we feel that we have lost everything. That we sinned and sinned again. And we turn to God and we say, Lord, forgive us. Sometimes, and I'll even admit this for myself, sometimes I pray to the Lord and I think, is He really going to forgive me this time? Is He really? Unfortunately, I snap out of it eventually, but there's always that fear. What if He doesn't this time? What if He doesn't forgive me? What if His grace has run out? You see, in the end, I'm still thinking in my terms. I can't earn my way there. It's not even saying that the person who did wickedness and turned to righteousness has now repaid their debt. It's saying that they have a new heart and a new spirit. See, we are made alive. We are made into someone who is welcome in heaven. We turn from everything that God says not to do. We say, we don't want to do that anymore. We don't say, I don't want to do that anymore because what if I can't get forgiven enough? We say, I don't want to do that anymore because that's not what God wants me to do. See, when we make it about ourselves, about whether this will add to my debt or whether this will erase my debt, we're making it about my debt and my debt and my goodness and my goodness. But if we just put all that aside and say it does not matter what we did yesterday, what matters is what we do today. What matters is what we do tomorrow. What matters is if today I'm looking forward to what will benefit me versus what will follow God's will. And no matter what we did in the past, it does not matter what we did in the past. Paul was a murderer of the church. And when he went to heaven, I promise you God did not announce him as such. See, God does not see us by what we did before. God sees us as the one who turned from their ways to him. Who acknowledge that we can't do it. When we think to ourselves, do I have it in me? The answer is no. Now this doesn't mean we ought to forsake righteousness and just say, oh it's all God, let's just keep doing. What it means is we ought to truly have a change in our life. We ought to forget our old ways of thinking. What will benefit me? Is it what will benefit me on this world? Is it what will benefit me in the next? Or is it simpler than that? Is it what God wants? You see, if I care for someone and I help someone who I love, because then the world will see it and see me as a great, benevolent person, what's the good in that? Maybe it helped them, but that makes me, that doesn't make me a good person. That makes me no different than the people who in the Old Testament times would take as much loud change and when the tithing comes by, they drop it in to make it as loud as possible so that everyone knows how much they gave. What they gave didn't matter, it's that they did give. 
the mother they gave because of themselves or if they gave because they loved the Lord. What this passage is about is about forsaking everything that we were before. And I mean that, completely forsaking everything that we were before. The way I was before Christ, I don't want to go back to. The way I was before Christ was I was the wicked. I did as I wanted. I did what I felt would help me. And I was on the way to die in my wickedness. But then I found Christ. And it says, And the wicked will turn from all his sins he hath committed, and keep my statutes, and that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live and shall not die. It wasn't because I suddenly became such a great person, or because I suddenly had done more righteous deeds than unrighteous. It's because I was willing to acknowledge that God is greater than me. That God's desire is greater than even my benefit. If we are willing to give our life to God, even if our reward is simply walking with Jesus down streets of dirt, then I think that's a mentality that He wants. He doesn't want us to go to heaven because of the gold. He doesn't want us to want to go to heaven because of all the crystal and the pearly gates. What type of father wants their child to want to visit their house because they have a mansion? It's sure great to have that pride. But wouldn't you want someone to visit you for you? That's all that Christ asks of us, is to put Him first. To not view our ways as equal and His ways unequal. Not to view our system as greater than Him, or even to view that we ourselves can do righteousness. It doesn't even talk about the righteous man who stays in righteousness. Fall short of the glory of God. And so I think that this verse is a verse that we should all think upon. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live. All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. See, if we just live the righteous life, but don't stay devoted to Christ, we were never with Christ. For he says, if they were with me, they he says, if they were with me, then they will stay. See, it's not about our deeds. It's never been about our deeds. It's never been about our balance or our account of how great we were or how awful we were. It was always about whether we acted for Him or acted for us. For even those who live in legalism, living believing that if they do this many, this many bobs during the prayer, or they wear this many articles or this many ribbons. To people who believe that, they're still forgetting who it truly is for. We ought to do all things unto the Lord. Do all things unto Christ. For I, for, and this says the Lord, For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord, wherefore turn from yourselves and live ye. Because why will ye die, O house of Israel? Now if you wish not to die and perish, 
today. If you don't know where you're going, if you don't know if you've truly devoted yourself to Christ, if you don't know if you've devoted to Christ's actions because you want that place in heaven, or if you want Christ for Christ, if you don't know even that He truly died for you, that He loves you, that to Him you are worth dying for. And if you don't know that He not only died for you, but that He raised Himself again to overpower that death that had power over you. If you don't know any of these things, if you don't know that salvation is available for any single one of you, that all we have to do is turn to God to believe. He doesn't ask for perfection. He doesn't ask for us to be the man who lived in eternal righteousness. He just asks for us to turn to Him. Make for ourselves a new heart and a new spirit to follow after Him. For why will ye die when He has made it available to every single one of us? If there's anything that you need prayer for, if you would like to rededicate your life, if you would like to receive Christ, if you would like to be rebaptized, if there's anything you would like to do, if there's anything you need prayer for at all, I invite you to come as we sing. The altar is open. And everyone at home, just give us a call. If you have any questions whatsoever, if you would like to ask about Christ, if you would like to ask about Jesus, if there's any questions you have at all about God's Word, about Scripture, about the Savior who died for you, my phone number is 717-818-2057. Call any time. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't wait. Do it now. Find faith in the Savior who died for you. And when you die, you will meet Him in the very heaven that He prepared for you. And if you have any youth, we have youth group, Vision Youth, at 6.30 p.m. at Friendship Baptist Church, right here, on Thursday nights. Every Thursday night, we have it either here or we have a special event. Call ahead to make sure that you know whether we are here or we are at a special location that day. Praise the Lord and we'll be praying for you.